Well, uh, April 26, depending on where you live um, on the Pacific Coast, and uh, it is, and where Eric Hopp and I are. So we'll call it that for today. Um, we're going to have him kind of give us a lowdown on everything that's been cooking um, in smart contract land. Um, I think a lot has been happening. I've been seeing a lot of work on GitHub. Um, so we're getting closer. Uh, and so we'll find out how much closer we are. So I'll hand it over to Eric. And uh, why don't you kind of give us uh, your rundown, please? OK. Uh, I don't know if I have that much to uh, to do, but um, we'll, we'll try. Uh, let me think where we were two weeks ago. Um, I was working on the client side code, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the Go code is uh, client side code is working. Um, and I've started on the TypeScript site, but that will require some more work um, because the, because of the way I now reuse code. Um, that means that under the hood, uh, I need to switch between uh, different uh, underlying frameworks mm -hmm. and that switch was already built into the Go code, but that switch wasn't yet built into the TypeScript code. So that's what I'm, I was working on. Um, meanwhile, I had Yang Hao investigate a, uh, a memory leak problem that we experienced with the Wasm time, uh, Wasm VM. And, uh, he dug in deep and he came up with some leads and one of those leads triggered something uh, in my mind so i dove into that as well and uh, sure enough um, they had changed some kind of order of doing things um, in in the wasm time that i hadn't noticed and that was part of what was causing uh, the problem. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was loading the WASM code on every function call, but they had reshuffled stuff so that you could only, only needed to load the WASM code once, and then you can instantiate that multiple times. Mm. Um, so I had to do some refactoring in the WASM VM to uh, get that order incorrect and that meant that the memory leak disappeared in a way um, but it got replaced by uh, a max instantiation limit in the wasm time vm you can only instantiate ten thousand times and then they're saying yeah yeah that's enough um the problem is that uh, those instances are being put in what they call a store, and there's no way to tell the store that the instance is no longer necessary. So you just keep adding instances, and in a way, that's another instance of a memory leak. Um, but the refactoring, uh, I continued it a bit, and I have now isolated the place where we create the instance, and uh, I only need one more step in the refactoring, and that uh, will be that uh, the moment we we uh, hit some threshold number of instances, mm -hmm. let's say a thousand or so, um, I am going to drop the entire VM and just start a new one. That that's kind of a, a crude garbage collection. Uh, that that I will be used. So once every thousand or so uh, instances, uh, I just say, okay, drop the entire store with everything in it, and then we are going to reload the wasm code and relink, and uh, then we can start creating instances from number one again. So we have another bunch of ten thousand that we can do, and well, <coughs> the. 
memory wise, memory usage wise, it's uh, it's wiser to uh, set that limit a bit lower so it doesn't use up gigabytes. So that's why I'm saying uh, maybe a thousand or so. That's that's a number we can tune, and then uh, that limitation should be gone. Um, meanwhile, I had Yang Hao uh, look at the at updating the interface definitions for the core contracts um, because in Stardust uh, there were some changes to the core contracts, uh, of course, because now we have uh, NFTs, uh, uh, we have the tokenization framework, we no longer have colors, so uh, that had to be uh, be changed. Uh, and that's that's something that means that you have to go through the code of the core contracts to see what parameters they use, what return values to have, which functions names there are, etc. And then uh, create the schema definition file for that, so that uh, the schema tool then can generate the interface code for the bottom lip. And uh, that's time consuming, so that was an ideal task for Yang Hao, which he did in record time, I might add. And uh, then when I merged that, uh, I noticed a few things that he had been doing. He had also been uh, changing a few names in the core contract code to make them more consistent. And then I was like, well, let's let's do that correctly then. So I straightened out all the core contract. Uh, function names so that it's now easy to see which one is a view and which one is a state update function uh, just by the name because they all have a prefix uh, they either have a view prefix or a func prefix views are views and funks are state update functions so that made uh, the code in, uh, in the WASP repo uh, somewhat clearer and that caused some cleaning up uh, on my side again. So for me, the next steps are going to be the um, the removal of that bottleneck uh, in the instance count, and then I'm going to go back to the TypeScript uh, client code. And Yang Hao uh, is going to uh, create a test suite uh, that will run a test on the core contracts, uh, on all functions, just just call, calling them, uh, mm -hmm. what what the exact uh, context of the call is, is less important, but we want to be able to de detect with this unit test suite whenever something changes in the, in the interface to the core contracts, so that one of our tests will fail, and then we know, oh, we need to update the definitions again. <laughs> That's easier than uh, yeah. trusting that we will be informed because that uh, is, is a step that is often forgotten. So, so guys, yeah, yeah, okay. So you guys oftentimes aren't in the, aren't in the know about changes that went happened upstream or elsewhere. So. Yeah, the, 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 they're working so hard on do, mm -hmm. doing all kinds of refactoring that uh, that well, they don't even often know that it would be nice if we would be informed of that yeah, particular right. change. So uh, I keep an out, eye out on that usually, but uh, it's it's handy to immediately get a broken unit test and say, that says, hey, uh, mm -hmm. something changed here. So update the definition. So that's pretty much it from the smart contract bottom side. Um, Let's see what other stuff has happened. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to uh, running the uh, clusters, which means uh, running nodes uh, and actually uh, having a committee running mm -hmm. uh, and then loading smart contracts into that. And Now, are you guys doing that internally already? Um, um, I'm not quite sure because that's mostly done by uh, by the others. Um, yeah. But uh, the last time I checked, uh, they were getting close. Yeah. Uh, 
um, my uh, my efforts for the <coughs> for the client side code at some point will need a cluster. I I want to be able to run the the Wasp cluster uh, tool to be able to test. Oh, that's a, that's one thing I missed. Um, because the Wasp cluster tool wasn't ready yet, and oh. I wanted to be able to test my smart contract code, I now uh, created a, a version of the client side code that uses Solo as the back end. <laughs> so it's funny how the design um, makes all these kinds of weird combinations really easy because it, it took me like uh, a day or so to implement that uh, and it means that i'm reusing the same code that's being generated in four different ways now uh, you know the the code that the schema tool is generating is being used within smart contracts to be able to call other mm -hmm. smart contracts uh, within the unit test framework, uh, we integrate with Solo, so that uh, by using the smart contract call interface that is being generated, you can call the smart contract from Solo, so you can initiate all the functions and, and send, send tokens and such. Uh, then uh, we have the client-side code that reuses the same code but in the context of uh, the, the, the client, uh, that means that we have a service that runs uh, and that can talk to the uh, WASP API, mm -hmm. and the code uses that context to properly send the, the calls to the smart contract code over that uh, web API uh, interface. And since that means that you need to run uh, a uh, a cluster essentially, or at least a wasp node, uh, and the wasp node wasn't there, so I now have a fourth one where we, get, we have a context that is a service, but the service client is a plugin that I can switch out between the one that uh, does the calls over the web API and one that. Uh, creates a uh, solo context and then uh, uh, sends the call to that solo context instead. Nice. And that means that I could debug all the client software, including event handling and everything, uh, without even being able to run a node yet. So uh -huh. that's, uh, that's quite cool. That is very cool. Yep. Yeah. So... But uh, yeah, for the TypeScript, I'm probably going to need uh, the WASP cluster to run because that is harder to debug, right? It, it doesn't integrate with Solo uh, that way because Solo is in Go. Mm -hmm. So I won't be able to do the same thing there. So uh, yeah, how, how to debug that uh, is going to be... Uh, a bit more of a problem, but I, I first need to do that refactoring to be able to switch between the contexts. So that's that's number one on my list. So yeah, uh, meanwhile, um, there's a lot of cleanup happening now on because all those refactoring create shit lots of artifacts, of course, mm -hmm. in the code and. Uh, a lot of cleanup is happening. Uh, we're we're now at the point where we where we can actually do a go install and no longer get error messages from from sub projects that we don't need yet. So they all compile at least, even if they're not. Uh, some of them were not tested yet, but I, they at least compiled without errors. And uh, I believe Horik is uh, currently working on. Uh, getting everything lint free, so the, the Go linter is uh, going to be run. And he already uh, said that uh, the linting tool helped uh, find uh, two or three bugs that otherwise would have been missed. So that's definitely a good step. And when once we're lint free, you should be able to run lint. 
print on the entire Wacht repo uh, without getting any any messages. So yet another step. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the progress that I can mention because it's it's getting into more and more little details that take longer and longer to do. Yeah. So the the huge steps that you seem to make initially, that's uh, governed by the eighty twenty rule. Mm-hmm. So eighty percent of the code takes twenty percent of the time, and vice versa. <laughs> and we're now we're now in, in the vice versa process. Yeah, the little dicey stuff. I get some more thinking going. Um, okay, so. Uh, so that's kind of a synopsis of what's going on on your side of the house, and what what can you share anything or uh, about what you're seeing on the EVM side of the, of the world, um, how that's progressing? Do you have some insights there? Um, we now have an, uh, the EVM integrated as a smart contract, mm-hmm. um, and. The EVM itself calls a kind of a magic smart contract at EVM level that provides the interface to the uh, ISC sandbox. Okay. So the functionality of the ISC can be called through that contract. So that means that at a solidity level, you are able to call all kinds of uh, ISC functionality if necessary. Okay. Um, I don't know if we have wrapped the, the tokens yet. I don't. I don't think I've heard that part okay. yet. But Dave has been uh, hooking up all kinds of Ethereum tools to the EVM. Uh, to see how well it works and uh, was uh, happily impressed with uh, the amount of things that worked. That's good. So that's good. Dave Dave is very knowledgeable. Uh, Dave is our fearless leader, right? Uh, yeah. The, the guy who runs the, right. the team. Mm-hmm. And he is very knowledgeable uh, about uh, the whole EVM uh, stuff. Yeah. And then uh, especially uh, DeFi and that kind of shit. So he uh, he has been doing some testing of his own, and yeah, that uh, that's looking good. Uh, so yeah, we're we're moving forward, uh, albeit at a bit of slower pace because it's now a lot of debugging going on, and the bugs are usually no longer the low hanging fruit, so it takes a little longer. Uh, but yeah, we're making good progress and uh, starting to connect all the different systems together, and that's where you you find out if you have a symphony or not. Yeah, right. And I'm uh, I'm pretty hopeful that uh, yeah, around summertime, depending on when when everybody goes on vacation and such, <laughs> how, how much that's how much that impacts the progress, but. Uh, yeah, didn't they? Didn't the IF put out an edict that that nobody can go on vacation this summer? Didn't I hear that? Uh, they can try. <laughs> yeah, it just kills me. Like it was like one or two months, right? People of, of cycles of people not working. Amazing. Mm. No, I mean uh, the amount of time that I spend on. Uh, on the whole smart contract system and other stuff. If I would really rack up all the overtime and oh, yeah. time and vacations that I didn't take and, and things oh, yeah. like that, uh, I could I could take off the rest of the year probably. I'm sure of that. I'm sure. So I, I have absolutely no reservations against taking vacations whenever no, the fuck I, I want. No, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Uh... It just messes with dates, right? And that goes for that goes for a lot of people. So, oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I everybody's working their butt off. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you got it. yeah. Uh, 
Anybody have any questions um, for Eric? Um, also, you know, I know um, other folks, like Kumar, you're in, um, you've been doing a lot of work with this, um, Sebastian. Um, if you guys have any insights from your world, uh, you know, feel free. I know it's uh, kind of late for you, Kumar, so maybe you can't talk. Um, but um, anybody else have any thoughts, questions? Well, this could be a short one. <laughs> it sounds like uh, we're moving in the right direction, huh? I yeah. I would... Uh, rough, rough estimate, if we're not bumping into real showstoppers. Mm -hmm. um, I know we don't, we don't give deadlines. This is sure. not a deadline. Right. But my my personal uh, view on it, I would say uh, somewhere beginning Q3, we will be uh, having a, a test net with smart contracts. Oh, with smart contracts, okay. So that's that's all going very well. The, the, the node software is coming along uh, very well, so the... the Chrysalis node software on, on, on uh, Hornet and B, mm -hmm. so that's that's good. The, they they provided us with everything we need, so it's uh, that that level of integration is uh, is is looking very good. So I think that uh, we we don't have any known big issues at the moment. So it's it's just a matter of chugging along and uh, uh, shaking out the bugs, getting things to work. And uh, okay, so maybe we've got. <coughs> I think point. I think in in a month we're we we will be in a in a space where we have uh, most of the tools back up running again, and it's mostly a matter of of debugging. Okay, so in the past we've had still some. Things that need to be worked out or invented, um, on, and basically those things seem like they're figured out. So now it's coding and bolt, bolt, bolting them together and seeing if they worked as as the design spec, right? Yeah, yeah, That's and good, yeah. and and some some stuff has been shifted in behind the scenes anyway. Uh, even though we, we we would pretty much put a hard stop on uh, adding features, um, for example, uh, Ivaldas can't help himself, <laughs> so he 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 added uh, proof of inclusion, for example. Ah, so that's 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 a nice to have though. That's for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. And 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 that that's something that you already. Where are you with that on your stuff? Um, that doesn't have much of an impact okay. on, on what I'm doing. Uh, I, it's only going to be. Uh, it depends on on what what gets exposed through the sandbox interface, right? That's okay. essentially the only stuff that I need to take into account. All the rest is magic to me, essentially. Okay. So uh, the proof of inclusion, uh, it, I believe you can uh, you can use some some functionality in the core contracts to uh, to do stuff with that. <coughs> so as long as I make sure that the co the core contract interface is complete, of, or as complete as I can make it, uh, then uh, from those smart contracts uh, you can uh, you can do all kinds of uh, things with the core contracts. And therefore, with well, what, whatever is inside of core contract. So, one thing that we we still need to create uh, mm -hmm. that's something I, I realized yesterday is we don't have a core contract interface for the EVM yet. So it's going to be fun because we could be calling EVM functionality from our contract. That is where this. That that's going to be in, in, very interesting. Yeah, it's uh, going to be entertaining. 
Yeah. So, I mean, the proof of inclusion is far from a nice to have, right? But a great thing to add. I'm not sure I fully understand what is the last piece now. What would that do? This API of the EVM contract? Um, the EVM core contract provides uh, a, a bunch of functionality. Um, let, let me quickly, I have it open here, so I should be able to see where is it, EVM implementation. Oh, it's even open on my screen already. Uh, it allows the EVM to set the gas ratio, get the gas ratio, set block time, mint block, apply transaction, get balance, call contract. So I, I could call a EVM contract pro probably, get the nonce, get a receipt, get code, get block number, get block by number, get block by hash, but that's all similar to core contracts that we have in ISC where we can get block numbers and etc. Mm -hmm. uh, get transaction by hash, get transaction by block hash, all kinds of functions to get transaction counts, get storage. Well, I don't know exactly what we will be able to do with that, but it looks like the interface is uh, is pretty uh, well. I don't know if you would call it extensive. Depends on what those functions uh, in themselves have as parameters, right? Uh, if you look at the call contract function, that thing probably will have a bunch of parameters that need to be specified. <coughs> uh, oh, there, it gets a call message. So I need to figure out what the call message structure is. So that <laughs> in our interface, we need to build that message then that we need to pass to the call contract function. It's probably the same kind of message that internally in the EVM is being passed when, uh, when a contract is called. So if I can build such a message from from my part, then we can call contracts in, in the EVM. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of a uh, an open end, let's say. Uh, that that's going to be uh, on the docket at some point, I'm sure. It's going to be fun. <laughs> okay. So all in all. Looks like uh, we've removed showstoppers. We're just working on things. Things are going as planned. Timeframes are tightening up. Um, yeah, we're getting more feeling of uh, of completion. Uh, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's starting to come together. Uh, it's it's mostly working as far as our unit testing is concerned. Uh, and and uh, yeah, the the proof is in the pudding, so uh, it's going to be uh, creating the the test net with the contracts on it to see if uh, if it all is stable enough. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, the current developed test net uh, is very stable. It has now processed five thousand blocks without uh, any hitches, without mm. so without failing anymore. <laughs> so that's a good that's thing nice. for the people who are using the older version. Mm -hmm. And oh, and I seem to have heard to this morning that uh, the pretty much they were going to stabilize the uh, the node software. So. That the the stage at which the, which the node software is uh, pretty much feature complete, and it's now a matter of uh, finding small bugs and such at the node level. Okay. So that's uh, that's also a good thing. That means that uh, that that we have a solid foundation uh, for the Wasp node to talk to. That's that's very important, of course, right? Otherwise, oh, you yeah. constantly uh in those yes no situations where uh yeah it's a problem on on the on the on the hornet node now it's a problem on the host node no no and 
then figuring out where the problem lies. Yeah, is the finger solved. pointing thing. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, not essentially finger pointing. No, but, no, just where uh, is this problem? Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you have a stable interface, you can reason about those, that interface better. Yes. Um, I, I, I remember from, from a past project, uh, we, we were creating this, uh, this system for airlines, uh, for small airlines that can't afford to have a huge uh system for booking flights and and mm -hmm. uh, planning and whatnot there is there is a huge archaic system that still uses old IBM computers uh, and you cannot really interface with it but it's it's a humongous system that runs the entire world essentially um that saber we, we, is that called Saber? I, I, no, no, I, no, I don't, no. I don't recall okay. right now. No but a, a, anyway, that uh, that system, um, we created an interface to that system so that we could access it, and that interface was literally based on screen scraping. <laughs> so we would, we would. Uh, Thirty-two seventy. Tra tra translate our call into actual screen cursor movements and typing, mm -hmm. and then the screen would update, and we would re retrieve that screen, and then we would uh, get the information from that, and that would be the, the what was returned from the functions, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had this huge specification of what all the calls are supposed to be doing. And uh, as far as us programmers were concerned, that was law, right? Yeah. So the first thing I did was write a huge bunch of unit tests uh, that verified that that was law. <laughs> and oh my God. <laughs> because that, that's, that interface was still being built, right? So we, we needed kind of things. And so I wrote a bunch of tests that would test whether expected things were being returned and uh, sometimes the interpretation of the spec on their side was completely different from the interpretation on our side. So even with a decent spec, it's very hard to get the interpretation of the spec correct. And that, that's a similar situation that we have here. Uh, we have a team that's working on the on on the node software, and we have a team that's working on the Wasp software, and they need to talk to each other. And there is kind of a spec defined, but in the interpretation of the spec, things might be different, and so you get some unexpected results sometimes. And then it it's a matter of the the yes no situation is usually on how exactly to interpret that spec, because uh, if they interpret it in a certain way in the Hornet node, uh, it could be that our interpretation, uh, if they have to implement that, it could be a shitload of work for them. Mm -hmm. So we always need to figure out what's the best way to go about on getting the interpretation uh, straightened out on both ends, right? So it could be that you get to an intermediate where, uh, well, if you can do this little bit on your end, then that allows us to do this on our end, and therefore we don't need to both do really serious big uh, changes on our code. Yeah. Right? So that kind of negotiation uh, is what's, what's happening uh, every now and then. So. The fun process of software development, and <laughs> it's it's a good thing that uh, we're all on the same team, right? So everybody is very willing to work with each other to solve the problems. Uh, because if if for example yeah. the node software would be created by a different company, then it's a whole different ball game. Because then yeah. that it's you, not you your will, problem. You, you will yeah, yeah, you will try to minimize your problems and, mm -hmm. and, and maximize theirs. <laughs>
Yeah, I've seen that a million times. You bet. Well, that's that's goodness. Anybody got any questions? So we're running in the corner. Sounds like uh, Eric was thinking that we're end of Q3. So really, what we're we might see testnet getting close to the uh, end of May, right? June time frame. Uh, smart contracts probably around July 1st, I would assume. Um, might surfacing right around then. I I would I would think that this this net. Uh, I I don't think. I'm not sure we will. Uh, make July 1st, but it, in early uh, Q3. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And then and then I think. My personal best guess is that uh, they will make haste in uh, getting the Shimmer uh, staging network based on that running as fast as possible, depending on how solidly the test network. So if the test network's really solid, then they're going to uh, yeah, really shimmer, get, yeah, get yeah. going on, on getting the Shimmer net uh, up and running as well. Yeah, and then and that's that's more public, right? And that's and that's actually a live network already, mm -hmm. even though it's not the main network, uh, because that's of course the Chrysalis one. But all all that uh, that is tested and vetted on on Shimmer will occur in Chrysalis, or uh, well, the main IOTA network at some point, and that in turn forms the base for assembly. So. All right. So basically. Uh, July, the month of July, testnet is coming on board. We, yeah, uh, you, the problem is with with July. That's vacation period. Yeah, no, right? I know, so I know. I like you. That, once that's you, once why, you hit, that's why yeah, once you hit July, that's why I'm hit, uh, yeah. I'm not making it a solid one. Uh, as, as far from what I see, uh, it's it's about two months left until then, and yeah, it. We should we should be able to get the test net definitely up and running by that time, even giving uh, some some vacations, and then uh, during Q3 uh, make that more solid. And if it's if it's solid enough to to run without constantly falling over, then uh, that will be copied into the shimmer uh, efforts. I, I'm sure. Okay. Because the, the board is itching to get that up and running, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think the whole world is, right? So um, Shimmer's the first time. Yeah. So, okay, Testnet will tell us um, whether or not or however fast Shimmer Net can come on board. So we really don't know until the Testnet's up, stood up and, and people are banging away at it. So um, Yeah, there's, there's not much use in external parties banging away at something when we sure. ourselves see it falling down regularly right so yeah at some point you you get diminishing returns so you 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 will say okay we know about this and this and this but let it let's let's open it up so mm -hmm. that uh, other people can work with it and then we keep on working on making it more stable but at least it's it's usable Right, but then, yeah. then the people who use it uh, need to take into account that it's not yet a hundred percent stable. But as as long as the the state is preserved and it's a matter of simply re restarting, uh, then that shouldn't be much of a problem, right? Yeah. So that's the point we want to get to. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to say it one last time. Anybody got any questions? Okay, um, I think we'll give Eric back his 15 minutes. So I thank you th uh, for that, Eric. Um, sure. Th thank you, Kumar, for uh, recording. You. On, um, we'll just carry on. Everybody uh, keep plugging away. We're getting close. So um, y'all have a good day. Talk you too. To you later. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.